Welcome back to Beyond the Headline, everyone. It's a very exciting day to be on the show with us because I'm here with the founder and CEO of Chartbeat, Tony Hale. Tony, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Tony, let's rewind to 2007. You're in New York, and this is just the beginning of Chartbeat. It was really thrown into your hands and you had to navigate. How excited were you? Um, it was a kind of exciting and a little terrifying. Uh, we were starting out a, a business that was in the analytics space where you already had people like Google uh, who had universal market share and were free. Uh, and then you had very large enterprise uh, people like Omniture and so forth who uh, were so much more advanced than, uh, than we were at the time. There was just two of us. Uh, and so there was excitement and a, sh and a certain amount of head scratching as how we were going to even survive the first six months uh, in such a tricky market. Thankfully you did. Can you compare and contrast what Chartbeat was then to where you guys are now and what's really exciting your team in 2015 and 2016? Sure. So I think when we first started, we, we first kind of uh, zeroed in on the changing nature of who was using data and who was making decisions in the workplace. So instead of purely focusing on the back office analysts and data scientists, there was traditionally the consumers of analytics. We were very concerned with frontline people, people who may not uh, have had much experience with analytics in the past and therefore needed uh, a very different uh, expression of that data. It had to be real time, it had to be designed in a way that they could access and we had to do the kind of the hard work of analysis on our side. So we had to have data science teams who could create machine learning uh, systems that could do a lot of the kind of hard work and, and guide people towards the right way. And that kind of early focus on the democratization of decision making is still something that flows through the entire company. Um, one of the things though, that as we've gone through uh, into 2015, we've really started to kind of dig into uh, and like rely on that data science uh, component to dig into like the depth of what content really means and matters. Like in the old days, we knew something about a URL and we knew a little bit about user behavior. Uh, now we know the second by second, pixel by pixel behavior of every user across every visit. And we're starting to really understand the content itself. So we're picking out named entities from these things. So I can understand not just that a story on the New York Times is getting a tremendous amount of traffic, but it's about the Paris bombings, it mentions the Bataclan nightclub, and the, its social share uh, of traffic is uh, much, much higher than anyone else who's also writing about that same story. I mean, it's a level of insight into not just um, the behavior of the audience, but the context of the content. And that's some of the most exciting stuff uh, that we're dealing with right now. And that's something that you shared in a recent blog post announcing some updates for Chartbeat, that the data you have is really giving you new insight into where the world is going. Yeah, it's... It's utterly fascinating. In some ways, I mean, if you think about it, we uh, get to work with about 80% of the top publishers in the US. We're in 60 countries around the world. We're getting almost half a trillion events into our, into our servers every month, which is a phenomenal amount of data. That is, uh, and with that, we kind of get to see uh, the truth of it. And we're not just capturing server loads uh, of people loading pages, we're capturing actual user interest and behavior, the actual amount of engagement. And so one of the things that's been great for us over the last year or two has been to, in some ways kind of debunk uh, some of the traditional heuristics and, and things that we thought about or thought, thought, were, thought were true about the web. And it turns out that actually when you look at real human behavior, it's very different. I think that's huge and it's something that really stood out to me as I learned more about Chartbeat. I think back in March, that was when you guys had the great piece in Columbia Journalism Review. And yeah. you discussed that for a long time we were focusing on the wrong metrics. You know, it doesn't matter if someone's clicking your article if they're not reading it. Absolutely. It's been, uh, what has been interesting is that there was always this assumption that if someone clicked on an article, they read the whole thing. Uh, and it was a little bit like in the old days where journalists used to uh, imagine that if you bought the newspaper, you read every single article in the newspaper. And it wasn't true about newspapers. It's also not true about content, even if you click on the link. Uh, in fact, 55% of all page views get less than 15 seconds of actual attention. 
Uh, and what was interesting as we kind of dug into that is that there were sentences and words that you would click on, uh, but not read. Uh, and in particular, we did one, we did one bit of research across some 10,000 sites and we looked at the most clicked on words across, uh, across the internet. And then we divided it into most clicked on and least read and most clicked on and most read. Mm -hmm. And most clicked on and most read were things like Obamacare. It was Syria, uh, and so forth. It was, it was, uh, it was Washington DC. It was real stories about real things. And then when you looked at most clicked on and least read, it was top, richest, biggest, fictional, uh, and so forth. You had kind of traditional clickbait titles. And we've all seen these, we all understand them. Uh, uh, but metrics had been telling journalists and content creators all, all around the world, these were the things that won. And they won people's index fingers, but they didn't win their minds. And that was truly fascinating. I think it's obviously incredibly fascinating from the perspective of your team, but in that article, you talk about how Chartbeat really wants to save journalism. So when a journalist wants to go in and write a really meaningful story, they have the backing and the tools to do so. And just as you say, you know, what the most read and clicked words were kind of gives you hope because it's very disheartening sometimes to be on a social network and on the side, see three of the top news stories about a celebrity not wearing enough clothes. So there are, there are things that will always capture people's uh, kind of immediate attention. It's like mental popcorn where it's, it's easy, it doesn't require any effort and so forth. That stuff will still always be out there. But what's interesting to me as well is that if you, yeah, if you start to change the metrics, then the stuff of quality actually really comes through. And you can have fabulous stories people spend time on that really do, you know, they're, they're the things that uncover corruption in DC or it's the, the story that inspires the cynical teenager. These things can come through and they are real and they're meaningful and we can define them in, in, in a quantitative way as valuable now, which is fascinating. As we reflect on the huge goal that your team has and one that I really believe is so meaningful, what does it feel like, as you and I were just discussing, to be at 100 team members now, all going after this? It's, um, it's, it's very, very strange, first, uh, first up. It's one of those things which I still can't get used to uh, as someone who was there when it was just two of us. Uh, but it's also inspiring to see people come and join the company. And they come not just because it's a, a fun place to work and because they can progress their career. They come because they believe in what we're trying to do. And that inspires greater activity, greater creativity in the way that they approach their work. And it's been one of the most heartwarming things to see is how each new person as, as they come in, in some way approaches the problems that we're trying to solve in a new way from a new perspective. But we're all, tr we're all here for the same reason. And, and that's, that's kind of the best thing about having a mission-driven business. There's, there's no doubt. And it really lends to, you know, everyone comes in and sees it from their own perspective, which is huge and it influences the culture. We're just discussing that culture is not a one-time thing. You don't write down your culture and it stays that way forever. It's always going to intentionally evolve. How have you seen it evolve? Well, culture is, yeah, culture is never static. If the culture is static, then it's dead. Um, you know, we talk about like, like Latin, it's like a, you know, as a dead language uh, and so forth, whereas English is vibrant and changes just as other languages do. Uh, and that is very much how we see culture. You often found, and as we were talk talking a little earlier, uh, the, the, you know, the 50th employee who was worried about how t culture was going to change when the 60th person came through the door, not realizing that the previous 49 people before them had been worried about how they would change the culture. And the important thing uh, is that culture is accretive. It changes and becomes richer and more nuanced as every single person coming in adds a thread to that kind of tapestry. And that is what makes a, a true company culture. It's not can you become homogenous? It's can you come in here and give of your best and as a result make this place a richer, better place to be? What are some exciting changes that you've seen to the culture? So I, it's, 
it's interesting because like the core of the culture in terms of a genuine kind of empathy and caring for each other, I think has been something that's persisted from very early days uh, because that's what we hire for among other things. We want you to be smart. We want you to not take any crap, but we want you to care. Uh, what's been interesting to see is uh, the different ebbs and flows of people uh, thinking through kind of as, as kind of design has, we started out being a very design led company almost to the exclusion of some other things. And then kind of data science really started to kind of take off and we started to balance out. Uh, and even within that though, we were kind of, it was very, kind of, very much a product driven culture. And one of the things that we've had to do in becoming a kind of a hundred person company now is trying to make sure that the different parts of the company are balanced and that when people talk about a product driven or an engineering driven culture, these things are, are all great and fine, but it means that some other part of the company in some ways, their voice is lessened. And really part of my job as a CEO is to make sure that there is a good balance because every single part of the company has an important voice. Our sales team are not just people who go out and sell, they are radar for products. They're spending time with our customers and they know things that we can't know sitting, sitting here in, in the office. And so it's really, really important as we've kind of built out these different parts of the company and, and different personas in those different things. You know, your, uh, your average DevOps engineer and your average salesperson in general have somewhat different personalities. Uh, but making sure that they all have a voice and that that thing is balanced is hugely important. How have you achieved that or how do you achieve that now? Uh, constant vigilance, I think, is the, uh, uh, is the only way that you can say it. And I don't get it right all the time. I think it's uh, you're constantly trying to rebalance and make sure that people are heard. Uh, and that you give them the opportunity and structures. And as you grow, it's harder and harder. You, you know, when you're 5, 10, 15 people, you can rely on uh, the fact that they're all within a few feet of you uh, to, to help aid communication. But as, when you get to 100 people and beyond, you have to start thinking about kind of what are the, kind of, what are the principles, what are the structures, and, and, how do, and how do we make sure that this stuff uh, enhances the ability for people's voices to be heard. How do you make sure that someone is heard, especially maybe if they're a new employee who just has an idea for a small feature and the team is working on some things that are really important? So a few things that we do, one is we have uh, systems for those ideas to bubble up, including things like every six weeks uh, we have a hack week where people can build whatever they want. We don't get to tell them what they want to build or anything like that. So if you have a great product idea or even something outside of, that, uh, outside of the product that you just think we really should build, they have like serious amounts of time to be able to build that. Like once a week, every six weeks, is when, it, when you look at it across the year, is, an, is a good amount of time. Um, also, one of the things that uh, I do with every single employee that comes in is I, I sit them down and I talk with them through the history of the company. And the, the very last thing that I say to them is that their job is not just to do their job. It is to help me, help me do mine. And for th that means that they need to be able to come to me, tell me when I'm being an idiot, tell me when I'm getting something wrong or when I don't have sufficient information, whether there's something new that they've thought about that I'm not aware of. And if they can do that and if I can kind of hammer that in early, early on, then you get this incredible flourishing of people who feel like they are empowered and autonomous and able to say, actually, you know what, this is crazy. We should be doing this other thing or look what I built in my spare time or, uh, or something else. And some of our best ideas have come from people completely ignoring me. What's the best feedback you've received? In what way? I'm going to say from your team on leadership. On, uh, on leadership. Uh, so I'm going to take this as, one, uh, as critical feedback. Uh, and one of the things that I think that uh, I suffer from is the fact that I'm British. Uh, and British people in America, uh, we say things which sometimes require translation. Uh, and so I can think of that I'm being very, very clear, but sometimes I'm just being very, very British. So actually there's a number of people in, uh, in the company who have translation sheets for when a British person says this, they really mean this thing. No way. That seems, that seems to work. That's great. And all of those types of processes just make things easier. As you grow, 
What are some ways that you guys have had to adapt from going, like you said, from being, you know, 10 people in a room so I could literally just tell you, hey, Tony, we're going to do it this way versus now I can't go to every person out of 100 people and say, okay, we've decided to shift. So I think one of the things that uh, I try to do still uh, and try to encourage others to do is to still have conversations in, in the open, as it were. So an example of this is, so we use Slack, as many, many startups uh, do before that. We were using HipChat, uh, which is basically the same thing, uh, just less hype. And whenever I have an opportunity to talk to someone, I try to talk to them in a public channel uh, because it means that information could get disseminated from our conversation. Uh, to other people who may or may not find that information useful, but it's accessible, it's searchable. They can go and check, they can, they can go and see. Uh, and also uh, a thing that we started doing recently is if we have a meeting, so I have a meeting with the executive team every week, being able to be public about what goes on in that meeting and say, here are the notes. Uh, this is what was discussed and being able to disseminate that and finding good ways to disseminate that is something that's kind of very important. So I think like you will have conversations and communications that can't involve everyone uh, because you would just slow down to a halt. But making the outcomes of those conversations accessible is a hugely important thing. Speaking of your executive team, how did you approach finding and hiring those individuals because it's a lot different than you know hiring an intern of course mm -hmm. so with my executive team it, if you think about it when when you start a company I, and I was the I was the person who wasn't the developer so early on my job was to make sure the developer had diet coke uh, and that was pretty much it. And then as we kind of grew from there, we started having customers. I started, I was, I was answering every single support request just came in and kind of a forwarded thing to my email. And I was responding through my email. I was doing all the sales. I was doing pretty much everything. And so effectively from that point, you're constantly just firing yourself from parts of your role. And so how I looked for my executive team was, uh, Effectively, what, what thing do I need to fire myself from now? Or what's the first thing I should fire myself from? Where am I not scaling? I need to do that. And in, in several situations, uh, it's been not a normal kind of recruitment process at all. Uh, there were my head of product, uh, I met some six months before I hired her. Uh, and I thought she was fabulous, but at the time I was convinced that I was the product person and I like, couldn't possibly uh, uh, give up this thing. I uh, went on my honeymoon and had actual a week to actually think uh, and step away from the business in the day to, the day to day. And I, like, within 10 minutes of getting back home, I had uh, emailed her and offered her a job. Uh, with my COO, who is uh, the guy who kind of is most responsible for running the business with me, uh, we spent maybe three or four months sending each other each other books that the other person had to read, and then getting together and discussing the books. It was kind of the weirdest dating scenario you could imagine. Uh, uh, to make sure that we kind of thought about the world in similar, or at least if we did conflict in interestingly, uh, in interesting kind of intellectual ways, and so. It's so hard to find the right mix, and it's so tempting just to hire someone who's just like you, but trying to find people who are uh, intellectually curious, who when you meet them for the first time, you say, I cannot let this person leave without hiring them. Uh, those are the things that kind of really make it uh, make it special. And yeah, it's generally, I don't think I've had a single straightforward hiring process in my executive team. I'm really glad that you mentioned books because I was so blown away on your blog by what an adamant reader you are. I know you can't select like one or two of all time, but from recently, which books have really stood out to you? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of books. I, I recently read a book about uh, casino design uh, that was fascinating to me. It was an ethnography of casinos and how they uh, create addiction. Uh, in design, uh, which was, uh, I, think it's, I think it's called Addiction by Design, uh, which was a very bizarre book to read, but it was wonderful. 
uh, on the fiction side of things, uh, the single best book I've read in fiction recently is The Orphan Master's Son, which is set in North Korea and won the Pulitzer Prize a few years back. Why is reading so important to you? Because I didn't really come from a business background. Uh, I don't have a background in marketing or product or engineering or anything like that. I basically spent the first 10 years of my adult life screwing around on crazy adventures. Uh, and so the only way I can catch up is by reading absolutely insatiably. Uh, but it's also, it's also the single fastest way for you to kind of download someone else's knowledge. Uh, I, have, I have not only learned a tremendous amount about my, my own business, but by reading broadly and widely about weird, weird things. Uh, and when you're a C CEO, you never lose that sense of your own company when you're reading the stuff. You're always thinking like, how do I apply this thing to my company? Uh, and it kind of it prompts creativity in a way that nothing else does. Uh, so, yeah, I try to make sure that I spend enough time reading. I think it's essential to my job uh, and essential to kind of remaining curious and creative around the world. And as you discuss, just as you were introducing that not having come from a business background, what are some lessons that you learned on the job that were really difficult but have just been instrumental to who you are as a person, as a leader? Um, I think one of the biggest lessons is uh, the importance of shutting up. The, when, you're, when you're starting and you don't have any management experience uh, or anything like that, you're, you have this deep sense that you should always be there immediately with the answer. You should always have an opinion. You should always speak in every meeting and be the, the dominant thing because you're, that's what people are asking. the CEO does. You're the CEO. Um, whereas actually in 50, 70% of those interactions, you're just saying something for the hell of saying something. And instead being able to be able to kind of calm down, have a little bit more security and just listen to people, uh, and just say thank you when they have finished and not feel the need to add your two cents. This is something that I fail at regularly, by the way. I, sometimes I just can't shut up, <laughs> but I try, I try to listen to people. Uh, and not think that I always have to try and add my two cents. I think that's really important, and it lends to an insight that you shared on your blog that I think ties really well here about we should do our thinking beforehand and go through what-if scenarios. And if you don't listen, the what-if scenario that you create is really not helpful. Yeah, I mean, we're just working with incomplete information. And this is one of the things that... Uh, that I that I found is well, there's there's kind of two things. One that uh, that post was around the time I was doing a round world yacht race, and uh, you simply do not have time when something really bad happens to think through a plan. You must have thought through the plan beforehand, and so learning to think through scenarios is kind of an important thing. It gives you kind of like but you're basically kind of constantly modeling the future, which is kind of the CEO's job uh, in many ways. There's also, um, uh, talking, of, talking of books as well, there's a great book called Thinking Fast and Slow uh, by Daniel Kahneman, which summarizes kind of psychological research over the last 50 years. And one of the things that they talk about is you have your system one mode of thinking and your system two mode of thinking. System one is your kind of fast, reactive, emotional, um, really good for kind of reflex, but not very good for deep thought. And your system two is your kind of like your deep, deep computing power where you can really kind of delve into a, a topic. And it's not just a variation on one type of thinking, it's two completely separate types of thinking. And if you're only ever coming to a scenario for the very first time uh, when, someone, when someone brings it to you and you haven't thought it through beforehand, it's often your system one that's doing the work uh, on problems that really deserve your system two. It's one of the reasons why uh, for every meeting and, uh, and every one-on-one -on -one that I have, I insist upon having a kind of a, a deeply written agenda with lots of information beforehand so that I can absorb it and think through and get my system two brain on it. Because uh, I want to make sure that I give people of my best and don't just react. I love the difference between the system one and the system two, and it lends to something that you and I were 
talking about before we started recording about sometimes you have to step back in a situation and realize you are not in control. And a lot of times when I'm in those situations, I always default to system one. Even if it's something small, my hands are in the air, life has suddenly ended because a profile is not working on the website. How do you pull yourself back and get to system two? Oh, so I th- for me, there's, there's certain things that I just remind myself of. It's almost like certain key phrases that are, uh, that are triggers for me uh, to remind myself. And like I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, there are three things that I can control in my life and these are the three things and everything else I can't control. And I will repeat that when I feel like I'm kind of uh, getting stressed about something uh, and so forth. I've also found that... Uh, writing actually is tremendously helpful whilst i don't write enough on my blog uh i write every night uh uh, and often during the day if i'm dealing with something you got to get it down on paper uh forces you to kind of think through what you're actually going through and you're no longer reacting you're actually thinking Mm -hmm. uh and so those have really helped me do you go back after you've written that and read it or is the exercise to just get it out of your head no, I, I go back and review. Uh, I pretty much review everything. So when I read a book, uh, I take extensive notes on that book, and then I'll review them uh, like a month or so later um, to dig in and then kind of go back every every so often. Same thing with uh, with this stuff because it's effectively it's it's about deliberate practice. If you're familiar with the the idea of like ten thousand hours towards expertise uh, that Malcolm Gladwell ripped off uh, Eric Anderson, um, the the core of it is not just 10,000 hours of doing the thing. Otherwise, you'd have many, many more experts out there in the world. It's 10,000 hours of deliberate practice where you do something, you observe what you did, and you try and adapt what you did to be a little bit different uh, the next time. And that's what I'm trying to do with my job. I want to get better at it. I, uh, I need to get better at it because the people out there who work for this company require and deserve that I should be better at my job than I am today. Uh, And so reviewing that and looking at how I would change differently for the next time I'm in the situation is a hugely important part of it. And when you review it, whether it's notes in a book or notes that you've just taken, you know, midday as you're making a decision, how often does it change your perspective? Uh, Pretty often. uh, it, uh, It depends, actually. I'll say... Uh, if I'm angry or emotional at, the mo- at that moment, usually uh, having written it out and everything else, I'll come to a decision that is almost 180 degrees different from the one that I, I was making when I was, uh, when I was angry. And it's usually a far, <laughs> in fact, it's always a far, far better uh, move for me to be able to do that. Uh, so yeah, that, those things are helpful. It's when, for some reason, you are not thinking calmly using your system too and something like that it's a good recentering and i think just the decision to recenter is so big and like we said it's the difference between reacting to something and responding yeah i uh i i don't have the luxury of being able to just react any old way because i have a hundred people who I love and care about and they don't deserve that. They deserve to have someone worth working with. Uh, and so, yeah, just being able to react in any old way doesn't, doesn't work in that way. Well, I'm going to have to close the part on culture on that one because that was, that was gold, my friend. The fact that it's always really inspiring to hear a leader who's getting better for their team and you it's so clear that you feel that not only commitment to them, but like it's your duty. It is. I mean, they're like it's it's a contract. I mean, they came here because and, and they chose to believe in this in this vision that we set. And if I want to get their very best, the only way I can ask that of them is if I'm willing to give it my very best for them. Love it. Before we go, we always focus on three questions that don't have anything to do with work. So. Oh. <laughs> The first one is, when you wake up on Sunday mornings, chart we decide, what are you most excited to do? Talk to my wife. 
Good one, because it leads to my next one. Meeting your wife gave you a love for country music. Yes. What is I, your, I, so go is, ahead. What is your favorite country music song? Uh, what is my favorite country music song? Uh, I have basically been listening to the early albums of the Zac Brown Band uh, for far too long. Uh, and uh, probably Toes is a, is a good song by his band. Perfect. And last question. You have lived a true life of adventure. Do you have any desires or adventures that you want to go on soon? Oh, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, in some ways, I miss uh, my old life where I was spending months in a tent up in the Arctic, uh, even though that sounds horrible to most people. Uh, I, I got the chance to go to the Galapagos earlier this year, which is a somewhat smaller adventure than the ones I used to go on, uh, but still contained the, the essential elements of adventure for me, which is that they brought me somewhere completely new, and taught me something completely new and that was fabulous and so uh I, I look forward to doing as many of those as i can my time is a little bit more constrained these days so i have to be a little bit more targeted in in the things that i do but uh yeah there's there's still a, f a few great adventures uh ahead of me do you have an ultimate one like if you could you know take off years and just the big big adventure uh so the one piece of unfinished business I always had with my polar expeditions that I used to do was that uh, my dream was always to be able to walk to the South Pole and back. I spent a lot of time in the Arctic, uh, and, I, and I worked very, very, for a very long time with a guy called Ben Saunders, who's absolutely amazing, um, to try and do this expedition, and in the end I failed. Uh, he... Uh, when I was kind of distracted by startups and whatever the hell it is I'm doing now, he actually got the chance uh, a year or so ago to actually do that journey and became the first man in history to walk to the South Pole and back um, and uh, on on foot without dogs or anything or anything else like that, uh, which was an incredible journey. And I am uh, in awe of him and hugely jealous. Mm -hmm. So if I had a, a year off, I would try and prep and plan and see whether I could kind of beat his time when you oh my god when you are on those journeys you know any of the polar expeditions what are you thinking during it's actually amazing because you unlock so much creativity if you think about it uh and i remember this vividly from some days in the greenland ice cap uh you start in the morning with a blank white expanse in front of you and you will walk dragging a 400 pound sledge behind you for some 12 hours. And when you finish, the scenery is exactly the same as when you started. It's almost as if you haven't moved at all. And so some people go a little bit crazy at that. But for me, it was, it was almost Zen in that by having nothing there in the scenery, your mind turned inwards and some like crazy book ideas, crazy business ideas, uh, all kinds of things would kind of just spill out. You would, I would go over like old relationships where I'd been in, I, I'd been convinced that I was the one uh, that was right and realized that no, I was a complete jerk. Uh, it's amazing uh, when you have a kind of blank space in front of you in terms of your environment, uh, just what your brain can, can come up with. So uh, I always found those things, even though there was very, very little external stimuli, incredibly enriching. Is there anything that you do now and others can do to get even a small fraction of that? It's like for me, for example, there is no way I'm going to the Arctic. <laughs> I think like uh, there's also one of the things that I know a lot of CEOs do and that I do as well is I, I practice some level of meditation, uh, which I still try to do. I try to exercise uh, and uh, I try to read. And I think uh, reading expands your, uh, ex expands your horizons and meditation gives you time to kind of absorb uh, and uh, get used to focus. And those things work pretty well together. Tony, it's really been an absolute pleasure to 
have the opportunity to spend time with you today. For everyone listening who wants to stay up to date with you and for individuals and companies who want to learn more about Chartbeat and how they can get involved, what's the best way to do so? Um, so they can uh, go to chartbeat.com. Uh, if they're interested in working with us at Chartbeat, uh, we have a number of open positions available. and We'd love to find uh, the next person who's going to kind of uh, make our culture just a little bit better. And they do karaoke, so. Yes. We That's love the our- selling point. Thank you so much. Thank you.